The presentation tonight is called The Open Space in Orion. And we begin in the book of Job. One day, God gave Job a vision. Suddenly, he receives a telescopic view of the stellar heavens. He views immensities and glories that defy description. Even as he stands stunned and speechless, God turns to him and says, Now, Job, listen carefully to this question. Can thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or lose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his seasons? Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? These questions God posed to Job. And the question tonight is, why did God pose these questions to Job? Let's look at two or three of the questions. First of all, the first question, canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? As we look into the sky on a clear night, we see thousands and thousands of blazing, whirling, fast-moving stars. One of these stars is Arcturus. This star, by the way, is a sun that's more than one million times as large as our own sun. To respect the size of Arcturus, it should be mentioned that our sun is one million three hundred thousand times as large as our planet. So is that a small star or a big star? Big star. Presently, Arcturus is rushing through our densely populated Milky Way at a tremendous rate of speed. In fact, it is the fastest moving first magnitude star in the heavens. Our sun is traveling at 12.5 miles per second. But our tourists is speeding at the rate of 257 miles per second. Recently, when a rocket was shot beyond the moon, it was traveling at 29,000 miles per hour. But our tourists, a mass more than one million times as big as our sun, is actually traveling at 925,000 miles per hour, and it never loses speed. So great is the speed of Arcturus that it, together with his suns or planets, is not held as a part of any astronomical system. Arcturus is actually called a runaway star, and is now traveling through our densely populated Milky Way system of 200 billion suns after which it will continue on through space and enter another Milky Way system also populated with billions of suns. Just think of it. What a catastrophe it would be if it should collide with another sun. Here is a picture of Sutum Sobieski. You can see how densely populated that, that is. Should Arcturus pass through this nebula, will it collide with one of these gigantic suns? Imagine the explosion that would result should this runaway star with its enormous speed and mass collide with another sun. Here's a polymer scope picture of the cluster of Hercules. Notice again the density of suns in the center of this star system. Should Arcturus pass through Hercules, Will it collide with one of its suns? The answer is an emphatic no. Why not? For you see, the Bible tells us that God 
is guiding Arcturus. That's why he asked Job, can you do that? And of course, the answer from Job would be what? No. And so God says, can you guide Arcturus with his sons? And now to establish his superiority, God makes that question. Now here is the point of this astronomical text that amazes me. It was uh, recently from the um, Palomar scope. This scope actually can take pictures uh, about 100 miles distance, can measure the, the edge of a straight pin. This telescope was the one used to actually discover how fast Arcturus was really traveling. Only recently did we know that it was a runaway star, a law unto itself, the fastest moving first magnitude star in all the heavens. We today had no way of discovering the secret without the use of these marvelous, delicate instruments. And so, think of it. Job had no way in this world 3,000 years ago, at a time when there was no Palomar scope, to know this amazing fact, except the master astronomer tell them, told him. Think of it then. Doesn't this strengthen your faith in the veracity and dependability of the Word of God? Now here's a second question that God asked Job. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades? The Lord speaks of the sweet influences of the Pleiades because they're so beautiful. The Lord speaks of binding the Pleiades because it is a group of 250 stars. They're actually a group of stars. There they are, the Pleiades. There are 250 of them bound together in the sense that they're all traveling in exactly the same direction at exactly the same speed. We might compare the 250 of them to a flock of birds all flying together in formation at ex exactly the same speed to a common distant goal. Now the following key question. Is it unusual for a group of stars to be bound in this way? The answer is this. As a matter of fact, this is the only group of stars in all the heavens bound by this kingship. In every other group, the stars, while traveling around a common center, are all traveling independently at different speeds in different orbits. Can you tonight see the astronomical significance of the Lord's question when he asked Job, can you bind this with influence of the Pleiades? In other words, can you keep those 250 suns together? What would be the answer? No. So how did the author of the book of Job more than 3,000 years ago, without the use of the Palomar scope, understand the astronomical facts so well that he could write the significant, intelligent question. This would have been possible only if the master astronomer had told him. Now, let's look at the third question. This third question is found, of course, again in the book of Job. Canst thou bind the sweet instruments of the Pleiades and lose the one? The bands of Orion. Uh, perhaps we can look at the constellation of Orion. Here it is. And if you ask what is the constellation, it is simply a figment of the imagination in which the ancients imagined that the bright stars which they could see formed a certain figure in the sky. To the Greeks, Orion was a great hunter who boasted that he could kill anything, but a small scorpion bit him on the heel and he died. So, Greek mythology is untrue, unscriptural, but can still be used as a valuable aid in helping us to locate the stars. Notice the three stars that make up Orion's belt. You see the belt right there? Okay. Now, I should tell you uh, something about this constellation. 
It is a constellation that can be seen from the North Pole, from the South Pole, from any place on the globe. Unlike the Southern Cross that only the people in the South can see, or the North Star that only the people in the North can see, Orion can be seen from any place on the Earth. Now, let's take a closer look. Here's that uh, constellation picture of Orion. And uh, the belt band. At nighttime, if you want to locate it, if it is a clear night, it actually looks in the figure like uh, the kite. You have the three stars there, the star here, and then three stars down here. Can you see that? So that's the usual uh, configuration that you can see at night, and it's the easiest one to locate. Now, why did the Lord ask this question, and what does it mean? What's the answer? See, at the present time, scientists have discovered that the belt band uh, consists of an almost perfect straight line, a row of three second magnitude stars. They're equally spaced, but these stars presently are moving and will approach each other and form a naked eye double. The third star will drift eastward so that the belt band will no longer exist. That's happening as we talk tonight. <clears throat> so presently, the belt band is being loosed. Unlike the Pleiades, no two of the stars of Orion are traveling in the same direction or at the same speed. Just, they're just like a ship on a high sea passing each other tonight, traveling at different speeds, bound for different ports. 3,000 years ago, no one knew this fact except God. Only after three millenniums of research and study have astronomers unwittingly confirmed what God said to Job a long time ago. And it's written in the Bible. Herschel, one of the greatest of astronomers, said the following. All human discoveries seem to be made only for the purpose of confirming more strongly the truths that come from on high and are contained where? In the Bible. But say, there are some other most amazing truths in the nebula. I want you to notice Regal, the great sun located just above the knee. Okay, that's Regal. The great Regal, while our sun is 1,300,000 times as large as our Earth, this star is 14,000 times as bright as our sun. Then there's Betelgeuse, pronounced Betelgeuse, spelled Beltagese. Betelgeuse, the gigantic star in the shoulder of Orion. While our Earth has a diameter of approximately 8,000 miles, Betelgeuse has a diameter of 260 million miles. If you and I were to live on that orb and had the same ratio in stature, how big would you and I be on that planet? Well, let's consider it. Here's the size of the star. Here's the orbit of the Earth around our sun. And the size of Jupiter's orbit. So can you see the comparison? Now, let me just show you another comparison. Here's the planet Earth in comparison to Venus and Mars and Mercury and Pluto. Can you see that? Now, here is the Earth in comparison to Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter. And you can see how small Pluto's have become. But if we continue to compare, 
Here's the earth in comparison to our sun. But we haven't arrived at Betelgeuse yet. Here's the sun in comparison to Arcturus. But here's Arcturus in comparison to Betelgeuse. And where's our sun? It disappears. So, how big is it? Or maybe we should say, how small are we? Which one? Let me just give you a, a sense of, as to what we're talking about. This is how big you'd be on planet Earth. This is how big you'd be on Betelgeuse. Now, just to put this in perspective, let's put some measurements. The length of your calf would be nine and a half miles long. The length of your leg would be 18 and a half miles long. The length of your index finger would be 11,000 feet. The circumference of your forearm would be eight miles. Your chest would be 138,000 feet. And you would be 37 and a half miles high. All this speaks of omnipotence, telling us how big God is and how small we are. Now, the most stupendous and amazing fact of all concerning the constellation of Orion. Again, notice the night sky. Can you see the stars? The three stars here, and one here, and the three here. Can you see that? Right in the middle spot of the belt, can you see that? Okay. Is something which has modern astronomers sit back with awe. For this middle fussy appearing star is not really a simple star, but it is in fact a gigantic nebula called the Nebula of Orion. Here's a polymoscope, close up view of the nebula. Astronomers, as they look at this nebula, say, isn't there some vast mystery there? Why? Because as we examine this spot with our modern telescopes, we find that this is the brightest, most brilliantly colored spot in all of God's universe. Why should this spot be more brilliant than all others? Could there be some reason for this fact? How is this mystery explained? Dr. Larkin of Lowe Observatory said that in the midst of the nebula is a gigantic cavern, a cave which is 19 trillion miles across and 53 trillion miles deep. So large that as we consider the size of the orbit of our world around the sun, we could place 90,000 such orbits in a straight line in order to go across the mouth of this cave. And I said 90, 90, 000 of our orbits. Now listen, no matter where we turn our telescopes into the sky, we see millions of stars. But here is a many-colored gigantic cave, open with no stars, empty apparently, beautiful beyond description. It is called by astronomers the open space in Orion. Again, why is this the only empty spot in the sky? Why is it so brilliantly colored, so beautiful? Listen to what Dr. Larkin of Mount Observatory, uh, Low Observatory says. What has all along appeared to be a flat surface of nebulous matter in the sword of Orion is shown to be the mouth of a cavern, a deep opening receding into the mighty distance beyond. It is like looking in at a door into the rear of the cave, deep within glittering nebulosity. The chasm is the most beautiful object visible to human sight. Pillars, columns, walls, facades, bulwarks, Stalactites and stalagmites are within deeps of deeps. 
They glow and shine superbly with pearly light. The distance of the rear of the chasm from the opening cannot be measured, but it must be three times greater in depth than width, or 51 trillion miles. Sirius and Centurii, following with fine ample room within this cosmic deep, torn, twisted, and distorted masses of shining gaseous matter adorned with myriads of glittering points, and the whole forms a scene of indescribable magnificence. This titan mass of pearly light, whence is origin? If it is a cold light, like uh, luminosity not due to heat, such as in the case of the firefly, then the mystery is beyond any solution in the present power of science. If due to heat, the quantity of heat must be as that of millions of white hot suns. I have traveled to many parts of the world and have gone to many caves. Rotorua there in the New Zealand, the great uh, caverns of the Carlsbad Caverns, the ca salt mines in Poland. I've seen many beautiful caves, many beautiful things, but they do not compare to the cave in heaven. When you compare God's great cave of the universe with its gorgeous beauty that defies description, you can understand why scientists are awestruck. Garrett Service said, is there not some vast mystery concealed in that part of the heavens? To me at least, it seems so, for I can never shake off the impression that the creative power which made the universe lavishes richest gifts upon the locality in and surrounding Orion. Did the great creator outdo himself in this particular area? The great poet Tennyson wrote a single misty star which is the second in a line of stars that seems a sword beneath a belt of three. I never gazed upon it, but I dream of some vast charm concluded in that star would make all worldly things seem as nothing. I wonder what inspired him to write that. Spurgeon, the great expository preacher, said this, in the heavens, God floats out his starry flag to show that the king is at home and hangs out his banner in order that atheists may see that he despises the denunciation of him. Then he wrote, he who looks up into the heavens and then brands himself an atheist is at the same time an idiot and a liar. That was Spurgeon. The Bible says, truly, the scripture declares the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And that's Psalms 14, verse 1. I was reading a book one time written over... Uh, almost 200 years ago, a time when the scientists had uh, no knowledge of the glories of the open space of Orion, a time when there was no telescope of any significance to understand the riddle of these questions. And as I read this statement, it said, the Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back, and then we could look up through the open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. 
I was thinking about it. How did this lady who wrote this statement, Ellen White, know in the year 1848, a time when there were no scopes of significant size, a time when scientists were completely ignorant of the fact that there was an open space in Orion. To understand the difficulty of making such a statement, one should examine the heavens on a clear night and determine whether an open space, a gigantic cave, can be located in the heavens. Such would be impossible to detect with the naked eye. A power beyond the human was needed in 1848 to reveal an open space in Orion. What do you say? But listen, Ellen White saw and heard more. She heard the voice of God coming from the open space and saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, ascending to this earth through the open space. Could it be that tonight we have located the throne of God in the heavens of heaven? where the new Jerusalem, the holy city, awaits the saints of God? If so, no wonder that the open space in Orion is so intensely bright. Most brilliant spot in the universe. And what's interesting is that scientists are noticing that it is getting brighter. The glory of God, more radiant than human eyes can look upon, is shining through. The redeemed, transform, and change according to the scriptures, will pass through the opening and enter the city of God. I don't know how many of you remember this promise. Can we read it together? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What a wonderful promise. What do you say? According to the scriptures then, Jesus has promised that he will come again. And at his coming, as he descends from the heavens, Revelation chapter 19 reveals that the armies of heaven come on white horses down to this earth. The greatest rescue mission ever undertaken in all the universe will then be taking place. And then, as Jesus with all his angelic hosts descends down to this earth, the scripture reveals that those who have been dead in Christ will rise first. Then we're told that children, mothers and fathers who have been separated from us will awake at that time and will begin to take their ascent into the heavens. Then the greatest procession ever recorded in Holy Writ takes place. All of the saved, all who have loved God, who have believed in God, will at last experience the reality of the promise of Christ. With Christ at the head of the great procession, they will make their way to the great city of God. And just imagine what a sightseeing trip that will be. As we rise higher and higher, and the earth becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, then we enter into space. And as we do so, the Lord will begin to point out some of the marvelous creations that he has designed in the heavens. Just think of it. Being able to travel through space and see the glories of heaven, the ring nebula, the veil nebula, the Pleiades, all of the gorgeous wonderful constellations that he has created. What a magnificent trip that will be. What do you say? Then, as we approach the spot, that gorgeous mammoth cave in Orion, 
What a breathtaking sight with its pearly light and diamond studded sides. Just ahead, we will see the great city in Orion. As we approach the walls, Jesus will stop us to give each one his crown. And now the angelic choir sings the song in Psalms, which says, Lift up your heads, all ye gates, and even lift them up, your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And the angels inside respond, Who is this King of glory? Not because they don't know who he is, but because of the excitement to see him. And the angels outside respond, The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Then the gates are open wide, and Jesus, following, followed by the redeemed, enter the great city of God. And now comes the day of days, the moment of moments, as Jesus faces the Father, and the redeemed stand four square upon the sea of glass. Let's imagine for the first time to hear the Heavenly Father say, Welcome home, children. What an exciting time that will be. Just think, dear friends, our Father will welcome His Son with a great multitude with Him. But He'll be greatly disappointed if you are not there. Our friend tonight, why not make it your choice to be among the ransom that will finally inhabit eternity? Will you determine in your heart to be with Christ there? What do you say? Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we have seen things tonight that many have not seen. How accurate is the scriptures? How precise? How much there is in the Holy Word? And oh God, that we're grateful that you've revealed to us things that defy the imagination how big you really are and how small we are. But we thank you, Father, that you have taken note of us and you have sent your Son that through him we might have eternal life. Bless each one of us and help us, we pray. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. In conclusion, I'll tell you a short little story. I was flying in a plane, and there was a lady that was sitting on my left. She looked Asian, and she turned out to be Chinese, of all things. So I asked her, what do you do for a living? She said, I'm a scientist. I said, a scientist in what area? She said, I'm responsible for all the apparatuses that are pointing to, to the sky to see if there's life out there. So I said to her, you're too late. And she looked at me and she said, what do you mean? I said, the Bible already tells us that there's life out there. She said, where? So I opened the Bible to the book of Job and showed her what the Bible says about life and space. She said, this is amazing. I said, and you folk are trying to build a, a city in the space, right? She said, yes. I said, you are too late again. She said, what do you mean? Then I turned to the book of Revelation chapter 21. And what do you think that says? And there is a city where? In space. Did you know that? Yes. So then I said, and you folk just have discovered how to make transparent gold, correct? She said, yeah. I said, well, look what it says here. And in Revelation chapter 21, it says that the streets of the city have made of transparent gold. 
She was amazed. For transparent gold, just some new invention, relatively new in our time. So she said, I didn't know this. She said, let me tell you something. My brother became one of these born again things. And he invited me to go to his church. And when I got there, the preacher sat us around a circle. He was a Bible and asked us to open up the Bible to some place about some bones, to connect it to some bones. Well, I knew what she was talking about, the book of Ezekiel, where it gives a prophecy of the bones. And uh, so she said, and then he said, read it and give us your impressions. And so she said, I felt so silly there, reading about some silly bones and giving the, this preacher our impressions about the bones. Well, she said, if that's all the Bible has to talk about, who needs this thing? So then I said, do you know I'm a vegetarian? She said, you are? I said, yes. She said, don't tell me, you got that from the Bible too? I said, yes, it's in the Bible. The first diet written is in the Bible. And then she said, this is amazing. She said, I thought the Bible was for funny, duddy people. Well, I said, can you see that it's a scientific book? She said, absolutely so. I had no idea the Bible had so much. She said, when I get off the plane, one of the first things I'm going to do is buy a Bible. Just think about it. The Bible is a holy book. It's a book that has so much wealth of information. And it's, isn't it sad, at least for me, I don't know about you, that I spent 21 years of my life believing that this book was something written by just some group of guys who got together and put it together, never understanding that the questions, for example, tonight, you know, could not have been put together just by some fishermen. There had to be divine influence to reveal to them those questions that today only scientists with technology could discover its truth. Can you understand why it is that I believe in God? Can you? And it's, it's just marvelous how wonderful it is that he is so big and yet he is willing to listen to us. Isn't that amazing? He is willing to hear our prayers and answer us. And so I'm thankful that for me, God revealed himself to a little ghetto kid growing up in Brooklyn, New York. He has changed my life, and I trust that you'll allow him to change your life. How many here tonight have been blessed by what you've heard tonight? Can I see your hands? How many have learned something tonight that you did not know before? Did you learn something you didn't know before? Yes. So the more you study, the more you know you don't know. Isn't that true? I'm thankful. Thank you so much for coming, and may God bless you as you walk on this Sabbath with the Lord.